Hello, everyone. I'm Christopher Goh from Singapore, and I welcome you to the ninth episode of the ASEAN Head and Neck webinar series. Please be informed that this webinar will be recorded, and in fact, is currently being recorded now. Today's webinar promises to be interesting, informative, and the topic is on head and neck reconstruction. The ASEAN Head and Neck Network was formed because we saw the need for residents and fellows to have continuing education in head and neck oncology during this challenging COVID-19 situation. The idea was first mooted by professors Alfredo Pontejos, Melinda Adam, and Patravut Batanasap from the Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand respectively. Subsequently, Prof. Mohamed Razif from Malaysia and I join in, and the five of us have formed the core group of this informal network. I now have the privilege to introduce our moderator for this evening, who is Prof. Patravut Batanasa. He is well known in Thailand and also in the region, so I don't really need to introduce him. Suffice for me to say that he is the former chairman of the Faculty of Medicine, Konkan University, Thailand, and also the current president of the Thai Society for Hellenic Oncology, Professor Patrana, Patravut Batanasap. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chris. It is my great honor to be the moderator in this session. And uh, I'm glad that we've been through already the nine episodes of the ASEAN Head and Neck uh, webinar. And this time is this very, um, <clears throat> is one of the uh, interesting topics that we have uh, uh, different views on the reconstruction that we're gonna talk uh, on the theme of the comprehensive uh, head and neck reconstruction. We have the view on the, from the principal, the regional, uh, flaps, the free flaps, the challenging in reconstruction, and also the non-surgical uh, reconstruction and, and rehabilitation for the facial defects. And we also have the, the panelists to join and share their experience. And then we have also the interactive session that I would like to invite you all to also post the question. And also we can have a, a very fruitful discussion afterward. And of course, as uh, every uh, webinar, we will end our session with the song that uh, this time is very special and our honor for, for Thailand because uh, it is a Thai song and you will hear uh, our friends in Arsene to join singing and performing this song. So uh, before I introduce with the speaker, I would like you to join with the, uh, the poll so please show with the question. We have three questions for you to, uh, to answer. It is kind of quiz and you don't have to worry uh, whether you're gonna make a right or wrong, but uh, just to see then how, you, how much you understand with uh, the subjects. So when, when you finish with the first uh, question, you can click next to the second and to the third. So please uh, feel free to get your answer that you, you think you know, you understand, or this is the answer of your choice. And we're gonna talk about this after the, uh, during the interactive session. Okay, I'm gonna count from one to five. And then I'm going to close the quiz. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. 
So no worry, because we are not going to give you marks, but uh, this is kind of uh, checking and also this will initiate uh, the discussion uh, afterward. Okay, so um, now uh, we have the three speakers to uh, give a talk uh, at the, for the keynote uh, lecture. Uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce uh, the first speakers. And while I'm introducing or during the question, uh, during the talk, you can also post your question on the Q&A up there. So it is our great honor to have uh, Professor Armando Chong, Jr. Uh, he is the past president of the Philippine Society for Otolaryngology Head Neck Society, and also a current uh, Philippines Board of Otolaryngology Head Neck Surgery Director, specialized in head neck oncology and reconstructive surgery. He is affiliated with the Philippine General Hospital, Hospital Manila, and Doctors Hospital and East Avenue Medical Center, where he's currently the chairman of the department. So please, Professor Armando, the floor is yours. Wait a minute. Okay, we can see your slide. So please, Professor Mando. Uh, a blessed good evening to all. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Batanasap, for that kind introduction. And of course, for the invitation to give a short talk on the said topics. And that holds true to the organizing committee of this webinar, headed by Dr. Christopher Go, Dr. Adham, and of course, Dr. Pontejos. Head and neck reconstruction and goals after surgery remains not only a challenge to the one excising, but also to the one reconstructing it. And also to the remaining members of the multidisciplinary team, like the medical oncologist, radiotherapist, prosthesis and dietitian, psychologist. So actually it is like a basketball team most of the time, we are the team captain for the careful preoperative evaluation and development of a treatment plan, taking into consideration the variety of factors, as you can see from this slide. This diagram illustrates to you the big three when it comes to the goals of reconstruction as form, function, and integrity. It is really a dream come true if all of this can be achieved, depending on the patient's health, comorbid, and wishes. And another thing, in a developing country like ours, the Philippines, there's lack of support from the government in so many ways. At the end of the tunnel, there are times the only one that can be achieved is integrity. Integrity is a must for all patients, and it is good enough, especially among the high-risk patients. But there are no contraindications, and the minimum should be two of the three goals. These are just examples we're talking about integrity, as presented from this slide. Another important goal is restoring function, but mind you, without integrity, you cannot achieve function effectively. And these are the, some of the examples, like this particular documentation, 
where a radial forearm free plug was used for a tongue defect. Enduring swallowing that new tongue will facilitate swallowing because of its contact to the palate. Another goal is form, aesthetics, or artistic as one of the synonyms. It can be done on the first surgery or second surgery. Who cannot stand a long procedure? On your left is a paramedian flap in place for a basal cell carcinoma and a scalp transposition flap for a dermatofibrosarcoma on your right. Having decided the goals, then it is logical to analyze the components, whether the defects is skin, muscle, bone, or combination. To decide the choice of reconstruction, the old reconstructive bladder was revised and renamed as the reverse reconstructive bladder, where free flaps became, because of form and function, seems to be the best choice among us. Allo transplantation is a different level. Despite this, the old school head and surgeons have their tested principles for so many years of choosing the simplest, but the most logical option depending on the case. Now let's go to my second lecture, regional plaps for head and neck reconstruction. By definition, flap is something that is broad, very loose and connected to one side. From another diagram of the revised reconstructive bladder, regional flaps remains or ranks third because of the allotransplantation. Regional flap is a reconstructive method where the soft tissue is obtained. Soft tissue is obtained away from the immediately neighboring tissue that surrounds the defect. You can appreciate the most common regional flaps here and above and below the neck, but I will emphasize more on the pedicled regional flaps below the neck that are still considered the workhorse for head and neck reconstruction. When free flaps are contraindicated, and I will just discuss the salient points that I have local experience with, except the supraclavicular flap, where my colleague from uh, PGH, Philippine General Hospital, Dr. Kabunkal, is the point person for this flap. Delto-fectoral flap is a fasciocutaneous flap that is located below the clavicle and is a savior flap when free flaps failed or those patients that are contraindicated to free flaps. Presently, it is still a good foundation for residents in training and for all of us head and neck surgeons. If the patient by looking has a short neck, and broad shoulders. Well, that is a good sign for a deltopectoral flap since its arc of rotation will be at its best. Actually, it was used by AMARD for nasal reconstruction in 1917, but it was Bakamjan who popularized it in the 1960s. The blood supply and indications are stated from this slide. Regarding elevation, in my experience, chance of success elevating it is if it's designed, is up to the tip of the shoulder, and less chance of success if it is unextended delta pectoral flap. There are times I have doubts regarding the reach of the flap. You just have to have a back cut incision on the medial and medial upper and lower end of the deltopectoral flap or the contralateral side of the sternum. 
This has been a controversial question. Is subfacial elevation of the flap compulsory? Subfacial elevation is just an option because the blood supply is just underneath the flap. And the fascia of the pectoralis major is just a protection. It can be a stage, one stage procedure. If you will de-epithelialize the bridge and tunnel it under the next skin or a two stage amputation. Take note of the one to two centimeter border. And at that point, you will stop elevating the flap. Lastly, the pivot point is the upper medial end. Aside as a replacement flap for oral mucosal lining, it can be transferred as a sensed flap. It is easier than done because you have to anastomose the supraclavicular nerves from cervical plexus three and four and anastomose it to the recipient nerves. And these are the pit poles. Mind you, it is very challenging as a free flap because of the short length of the vascular pedicle. To review, safe design is up to the tip of the shoulder. Subfacial plane is not compulsory. A one to two centimeter external border is the end point of elevating the flap. The pivot point is the medial end of the deltopectoral flap, the upper medial end. In order to extend the flap, a back cut incision on the medial upper and the lower end is a must, or a back cut incision on the contralateral sternum. I don't have experience regarding this fascocutaneous flap, and a colleague from of mine, as I've said, from PGH is the one doing this. It is a regional flap above the deltopectoral flap, and its main advantage over the deltopectoral flap is it is definitely nearer to the defect in the head and neck area. This is just an illustration of the said flap. Bear in mind the triangle, you can see the blue line. That is the external jugular vein, the sternocleidomastoid and the clavicle on the inferior portion, that is the triangle. The, the dictum is to stop elevating at this point. And one thing more, using this will negate the, the use of the complete elevation, or it will negate the complete elevation of the deltopectoral flap, rendering it as a reduced flap, which can be based on the second internal mammary perforators. It was introduced in the 1940s, but popularized by Lamberti et al. thereafter. Plus factor for this flap, it is a one stage procedure and the shorter time of harvest. It is a thin pliable flap like, like the delta pectoral but this one has a similar color and texture, unlike the delta pectoral flap. The pivot point is the vicinity of the transverse cervical artery. It is always subfacial, then subperiotial at the area of the clavicle, and is stopped at the area of the triangle. As much as possible, avoid paneling, but this is not an absolute contraindication. So this is the, a case of a lesion, stage four at the left, left retromolar trigone, mucoepidermoid. So based on the induration, it has been marked intraorally. After a lateral mandibulotomy for exposure, take note of the required dimensions and design it over the shoulder until the shoulder cap. Please bear in mind, that I have mentioned that regarding the flap elevation, you should stop at the triangle, and that is safe enough. 
Well, this is just a closer view of the reception site with the donor site just adjacent to it. And there's a saying that the best color match and texture is when the donor site is just adjacent to the defect. This is the flap in place and the mandible has been closed. And on your right is after the closure. One advantage is that you can close it primarily, unlike a deltopectoral flap. And you don't need a split thickness skin graft like a deltopectoral flap. And there's no cosmetic deformity of the anterior chest. Let's go to pectoralis major flap. This is still the workhorse when it comes to the pedical regional flaps because of its numerous advantages. But honestly, it is a very straightforward for females in harvesting the flap, but it is very challenging among females. The history, blood supply, and its usage has always been mentioned in every head and neck book. If you can preserve the delta petrol flap, so much the better. And I always design it as a kidney shape to maintain the level of the nipple. It is best to be designed medially and inferiorly where perforators are at its best. And I always remove the sternocleidomastoid because it is an unfriendly neighbor after putting the flap to the recipient side. There are the ways to maximize the reach of the flap as you can see from the PowerPoint, but the least I will do is the last one with the abdominal skin because it is beyond the confines of the pectoralis major club. Definitely, hairy chest is a negative factor and designing the flap below the nipple is an option to avoid visualization of the breast. The bulky neck deformity is not a welcome sight in some patients and take note that the small island must be designed medial to the nipple to cover the area with the most musculocutaneous perforators. Most of the time, I really don't debulk because it atrophies in time. There are times I remove the skin and apply a split thickness skin graft to get rid of its bulkiness. Remove, removing the muscle that protects the blood supply sometimes will give you some trouble. So just to show you an actual patient, this is a pectoralis major flap on your left, designed medially to the nipple, is the best location when it comes to the cutaneous muscular, cutaneous perforators. And above is the delta pectoral flap in case the pectoralis major flap fail. Another salient point is as you elevate the flap, sepalan, palpate for the coracoid process, which is for me a very important landmark because two to three centimeters is the blood supply the thoracochromial artery. Well, just a little trivia about the pectoralis major flap with the nipple areolar complex. I incorporate it with the nipple areolar complex during my early years, gaining experience for extensive defects of the head and neck to emphasize that it was transferred to a new site with the intact sensation and also with each anatomic landmark coming from the chest, not really knowing that the nipple areolar complex do increase the vascularity of the pectoralis major skin and the rest is history. This flap is just a modification of the pe standard pectoralis major flap. And the only indication of this flap is for very extensive defects of the head and neck area. As you can appreciate, the various contributions in terms of blood supply, 
to the pectoralis major skin. Tactical wise, it is just the same, except that you're has harvesting the whole plop with the nipple. In most cases, you cannot preserve the whole deltopectoral flap. And the sternocleidomastoid is not a friendly neighbor at this time, and I will always remove it. And these are the more pertinent pitfalls as stated. Flap harvesting is the same, but the main difference is really you incorporate the nipple in order to increase the vascularity of the cutaneous portion of the whole pectoralis major flap. Harvesting the whole flap with nipple negates the use of the deltopectoral flap. You can see the, the standard deltopectoral flap on your left and the pectoralis major flap with the nipple aureolar complex on your right. Well, you can still harvest the deltopectoral flap, but it, is, will, it will be named as a reduced flap that will be based on the largest blood supply of the deltopectoral flap, which is the internal mammary perforators. Well, this is... A, an actual patient of mine, which is a very extensive advanced cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma that has occupied half of the face, involving the parotid and other adjacent structures. At this point, the lesion was removed where a total parotidectomy was excision. Part of the mandible was removed, neck dissection, and the said flap was designed based on the actual dimensions of the defect. You should always start with the lower circular incision, as you can note on that blue dotted line on the slide. And if there's muscle underneath the skin, that means there are more perforators from the muscle that is piercing the skin. And that's the time for you to proceed to your upper circular yellow dotted incision. And what is really challenging here is using part of the flap to seal the oral cavity from the neck. And this has to be addressed. So this is the flap in place with good skin color and evidence, and there's no evidence of other complications. This is the patient two weeks after surgery. Actually, there are three kinds of trapezius flap, and in my experience, more on the lower trapezius flap. This versatile flap was popularized by Baek et al. for head and neck reconstruction, and the dominant blood supplies are the descending branch of the transverse cervical artery and the dorsal scapular artery. After teaming up with my esteemed neurotologist from PGH, Dr. Yang or Dr. Chong, actually positioning is, a, is an advantage for temporal bone resection because the neurotologist can do his thing and I can harvest the flap at the same time. The largest that I have harvested is around 16 by 18 centimeter. And if you include the rhomboids, that will negate you identifying the blood supply. So please remember this. In order to increase the arc of rotation, just transect near the origin and insertion. And for that, you will have the best reach of the flap. So this is an occipital mass, 60 year old male, that is ulcerated, okay? And the initial histopath is basal squamous carcinoma versus eccrine adenocarcinoma. And a lower trapezius flap was used. This is the initial defect. 
And of course, you have to undermine to make it smaller, to minimize the randomness of the plot that you will harvest. At this stage, the flap was designed in an oblique manner and never in a transverse manner in order to encompass the maximum surface area underlying the musculocutaneous perforators. This is the flap in place and harvesting of the flap is less than three hours. Since the patient is not obese, it is very easy for me to palpate for the landmarks and also to guide you in flap elevation. Well, lastly, my discussion will be the modification of the standard trapezius flap. It is the Skyway trapezius flap. I named it myself and I started using it nine years ago. And the salient points are the same as the standard, except that it will bypass the neck skin in order to reach the frontozygomatic area. Well, this patient has it all. What else can I say? Pronto, frontal bone osteoregionecrosis, secondary to recurrent adenocystic carcinoma, bilateral maxillectomy, by frontal craniotomy, craniofacial resection, bilateral maxillectomy, orbital excenteration, intracranial resection, bureauplasty, what have you, with previous radiotherapy of 33 sessions. Preplap is not suitable for this patient and I just thought of maximizing the arc of rotation by bypassing the cervical skin and the flap can easily reach the frontozygomatic area. At this point, I have a series of five patients with a paper published last 2017 with Mihia Albueba and Balmores of Philippine General Hospital as co-authors. This is the patient two months after surgery and is for amputation and removal of the exposed muscular pedicle. Well, this ends my lecture. In a developing country like ours, the Philippines, palliative cases are still there, are still here, and lots of them for so many reasons. It is just frustrating on my part, but even if I can only help them in terms of integrity alone. When it comes to the goals of reconstruction, it is good enough for me and more than enough for me to give them comfort and care before it's over. Thank you so much for your time and effort listening and also my sincere appreciation to my residents for the much needed help. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, Professor Armando, for your uh, uh, inspiring talk and the uh, various regional flaps that we have learned from your talk. So we'll get go for a discussion afterwards. So next, uh, I would like to move on to the next uh, speakers who's going to give a talk in the view of the free flap. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Nat Niyomudong Watanai. He's a consultant in the Excellence Center in the Otolaryngology Head Neck Surgery, Plasioviti Hospital, Thailand. He's also in the Committee for the Head and Neck Surgery, Royal College of Otolaryngologists, uh, Head and Neck Surgeons of Thailand. He is uh, one of the experts in, in free flap that uh, uh, give uh, lectures on these topics uh, quite often. So at this time, the floor is your Dr. Nat.
Uh, not, I cannot hear you well. Can you check with your microphone? Hello, Kap. Okay, that's good, Kap. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you so much to uh, to let me share the experience about the free fab reconstruction. So uh, let me introduce my, my workplace. I work in Rajavati Hospital, which is located at the centers of Bangkok, Thailand. So mainly I work, I, I work as a head and neck surgeon uh, in, the, in the resection and reconstruction uh, unit in ENT department. Hub. So I think Professor Amanto is also uh, talk about the about the advantage of the of the local the local uh, and regional flap also but anyway uh, the free flap is quite uh, it, it, it will give the the benefit of the reconstruction at the same time such as the Im immediate reconstructions and transfer the well vascularized tissue to the compromised space and it can uh, improve the wound healing. But actually, uh, as Professor Amando talked about the locals and regional flap, the local and regional flap can do at the same times. But uh, the, more, the more superior for the reconstruction, I can, I can categorize as three, as three categories that free flap is above uh, the regional flap. The first one is about the area of the anterior mandibular arch. So in case that, uh, if we want to reconstruction in this region with the locals and regional flaps, the patient can have the anigams, which, has, which, which is a uh, cause of the severe malfunction of chewing and swallowing and cause of the deformities and cause the, of the OSA uh, post-operatively. So the fibular free flap or bone free flap is one of the reconstruction of choice. The other, the other situation that meet the free flap is about the subtotals and total pharyngeal defects. Uh, if we try to use with the locals and regional flaps, uh, such as PMM or DP, such as in if, if, if we cut the segment of the pharynx and we, we use the thickness uh, locals and regional flap, the patient might have the narrowing of the neopharynx of the, after the surgery. And in case that we try to, to use the second state, uh, I mean, two state regional flap, such as DP, the patient can delay of the radiotherapy after the treatment. And the last one for the special circum uh, circumstance is the massive defect. Uh, for this picture, uh, the patient have the basal cell carcinoma that invade to the the mandibles and maxillas, macromucosas, floor of the mouth, and extend to the skin at the middle and lower part of the face. Uh, at first, I think that free fab is one of just only one of the choice of the reconstruction. But anyway, um, when when I see uh, the presentation from Professor Armando, I think the regional is one of the reconstruction but anyway i will keep it as a second choice in case that if i can do the free flaps the deformity is less uh, so if if i if i decide to do the free flaps i will start with the clearly uh, physical examination i will exam about the defect size and the structure that we want, that I want to remove, and the aim of the reconstruction, uh, because sometimes the reconstruction want to 
uh, want the patient to return to fully function and fully cosmetic. But sometimes uh, we just need only a complication prevention aim. For the neck, uh, neck examination, mainly I will, I will examine that the neck is, is clear or not. I mean, the, is there any previously treatment priorly or not? Uh, because in general, in general, I will do I will do the anastomosis uh, with the recipient in the neck area. So the, I might pay attention on the examination for the neck vessels. And for the donor side, I also I also check the check the the the, the size and the the scar formation. I mean the previously previously uh, disease of the patient. And I also use to check the dominant side of the, of the patient. I will use the less dominant side and I will estimate the function that, that the, the patient might lose after the surgery that the patient will accept or not. Uh, for the medical general illness, I also I was so concerned. Uh, I might need to get the information from the underlying disease, such as cardiovascular and lung disease, priory, uh, because uh, as everyone know, the the free frappy construction might consume more times, and there might be some bleeding. So the the patient should have more. Cardiopulmonary reserve to prevent the post-operative complication. The peripheral vascular disease is also, is also important, uh, especially for the patient who has the diabetes or have a chronic smoking, uh, because uh, the peripheral vascular disease is one of the indicator that uh, that show how does the how does the vessel uh, quality is uh, the last one that I like that I that I might concern is about the hematologic condition uh, such as uh, condition of the blood the blood component and the coagulopathies and uh, such as the chronic liver disease can can cause the malfunction of the coagulation. Uh, for the lab test, I, 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 I prefer just only routine uh, pre-operative tests. And that's all for the major, ma major surgery. But anyway, I will add on, I mean, I will focus on the CT of the neck with contrast. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, some most of the patients which, which do the head and neck might do the CT priority. Uh, but anyway, as I told you, I will focus on the patencies of the veins and artery because I, I might use it. And some degree of the atherosclerosis also. Uh, but anyway, I will pay more attention on the case that uh, have a prior uh, cardiovascular disease and the DM with complication. And the most important, the most important patient, I mean, the most important situation that I will pay most uh, concentration is about the case that have a previous surgery because I don't know that what, uh, what, what about the status of the vessel uh, that I have right now. For the ultrasound Doppler, I just use only uh, to ch just only check the the location of the perforators, and that's all for the Im for the imaging. Uh, for the planning, in general, I, uh, before the operative time, I will I, I might I might send the patient to see the internal medicine doctors and anesthesiologists to uh, to do the preoperative routine uh, 
uh, checkup, and uh, I might I might tell tell them about the details of the of the surgery. I mean, the estimate time of the operation, uh, estimate blood loss, uh, and before the before the operation and at at the operation day, I might discuss with the team uh, about the the mode of the surgery and uh, about the I mean I mean the step the, the step of the operation and the plan of the defect site and the defect tissue uh, that we need to reconstruct. For the intraoperative management, I, 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 for the primary side, I, I do the resection tumor with the adequate exposure as usual. Uh, but anyway, it it also important to uh, to assess to to set the flap is is quite important because if if we if we let the if we if we do not set the flap properly, uh, that can cause a complication, and that and that will then that may affect the anastomosis site. Uh, for the neck procedure, uh, once again, I will do the neck dissection as as the routine neck procedures. But anyway, the, it it might be remove the disease adequately uh, the most important most important thing is to is we need to preserve uh, preserve the vessel I mean I will preserve any kind of vessel that I preserve as much as possible because I'm not I I'm, I don't know that what kind of the vessel that I may use to do the anastomosis for the for the the flap hardware's, uh, we might clearly identify and preserve the the perforators for the for the case that I cannot find the perforators, I will abort abort the the procedure. I mean the the, the procedure of procedure of the flap hardware's at that time, and I will change to the new flap immediately. I will not try to blind. To uh, to raising the flap without any perforator detected. Uh, I, I I I I quite I'm I'm very obsessed about about the bleeding of the flap. I mean the the flap bleeding. Uh, it might not bleed in the area that uh, area of the pedicles, because uh, if we let it bleed at the pedicles. When we finish the 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 anastomosis, it can cause the bleeding and cause the hematomas, and compress the compress the pedicle of the flap, and in the in the area that we want to to let it bleed, such as the skin island, I will recheck until I'm quite sure that the flim, the flap is bleed quite well until until I uh, like it the pedicles. Of the flaps. So after I raising the flap, the donor side is also observed. Uh, I mean, I will observe the tissue perfusions. So after the, uh, I mean, I will observe the tissue perfusion after the the pedicles ligation in the distal limb uh, procedures, and after the the tunicate release. I might, I uh, it might uh, have a good tissue perfusion and might not have the uh, significant bleeding at at the releasing time. So for the flap setting and microvascular anastomosis, uh, for general, I routine set the flap before the microvascular anastomosis. I mean, I mean, I mean always. Uh, because I uh, I don't want to manipulate the pedicles and the pedicle and the anastomosis uh, after I finish the procedures. I mean the the microvascular anastomosis. 
uh, to prevent the kinkage of the petticoats. But uh, if, the, if the step of flap resizing and recontour take too much time, you can start the microvascular uh, anastomosis first and, and set the flap after to reduce the ischemic times. Uh, I prefer to put the flap in the good position. I mean, the straight, the, the pedicle of the flap should be straight uh, to prevent the kinkage of the pedicles. Uh, generally, I usually to keep the longest pedicle as much as possible because I want to get, to get the largest calibers of the vessels. But anyway, if it's too long, uh, and if I keep it, there is a risk of kinkage. I will, I will, I will shorten by by compromise with the smaller calibers of the vessels. So for the surgical technique of the microvascular I have some video to present. Okay. Uh, so this is the vid video for the radio farm free flaps. Uh, for the vessel of the neck, I, uh, I will check the location of the flap that I, that I will, that it will, it will locate it in the area of the, of the donor without tensions. Uh, so I, I, after I cut, there might, uh, I, I mean, I cut the, the, the donor of the, the vessel, they might not have the atherosclerosis at the cutting edge. Uh, and after I, I do the cutting, I remove the adventitious to prevent the inner displacement of the tissue into the lumen. Some of the mismatch is also acceptable. And the anastomosis was done by nine zeros, nylons. And the plot should be irrigated with the with heparins. So I do it. Uh, both sides, I mean, uh, anti from anterior to posterior. So I will check. I'm quite, uh, I'm quite obsessed about the the tissue displacement into the lumens. So uh, I prefer to, uh, in general, I prefer to do the anastomosis in the deeper deeper layer first, and uh, even it is artery or vein. So by uh, if the side of the donors and the recipient are not uh, uh, are not matched and an and unacceptable match, I will use the, the other techniques such as the end to side anastomosis. For this video, I use uh, the main branch of the internal tubular veins. Uh, the technique is is quite is quite similar to the to the routine end-to-end -end anastomosis, but anyway, it may not flip the the tip the, the vessel to uh, to suture at the back part. So after I finish, I I, I release the release the press. I mean, the re release the clamp and let the let the circulation functions. Uh, in, as I told you, in general, I will do the end-to-end -end anastomosis. Uh, for this video, I do the anastomosis, uh, the, the cephalic vein with the external tubular veins. So after I release the proceed, release the clamp, I will check the patencies. I mean, I will check the black flow, black flow to uh, to prove the patency that the, there is a blood that flow through the anastomosis site. Uh, we also have a shortcut, uh, shortcut procedure to reduce the uh, anastomosis time also. Uh, it is an instant instrument uh, we call quick coupling. Uh, at first, we might choose the, 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 the size of the, the size of the instrument first. I will check it and I will prepare the instrument. Uh, uh, 
the thing you need to do after you 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 choose a site is you you just put the wall of the the wall of the the wall of the vessel in into the pin and fix it. Uh, actually, I don't like this procedure that much because uh, for my experience, for, for, for my for my for my feelings, I think it's quite trauma than than I use the routine uh, routine anastomosis. So after I finish to to place the tissue in the pin, so I, I might twist the instrument. I mean the tip of the instrument and it will, it will coupling by itself automatically. So uh, during the time, during this time, I, I might flush, flush the, the, the vessel to prevent the, uh, the formation of the clot and uh, the surrounding tissue that enter into the lumen. And it will be a little bit uh, force clip by the, non tooth for sale. For the, for the drain displacement, uh, actually there is no consensus about this, but I, uh, but general, I prefer to, uh, to use large drain uh, for the adequate uh, suctions. And during the wound close, I might observe about the drain function all the time to, to make sure that, that the flap seal, uh, the hollow viscous, uh, I mean, I, the flap seal the defect properly. And I will place the drain just parallel to the flap. Uh, for the, for the post-operative trip management uh, is the same as the, as a major operation, but but I may pay more concentration, uh, pay more attention about the cardiovascular. Uh, in general, I, uh, I, 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 I might ask the anesthesi anesthesiologist to keep the to keep the C lines and the A line uh, back to the ICU. Uh, it will be easier to monitor the the propers. Uh, blood pressure, and I will keep the hematocrit is more than 30s. And that's all for the, for the, for the post-operative management. Uh, for the, for the pharmacologist, uh, once again, there is no con conclusion about the, the, the medication that improve the flap survivals and prevent the post-operative complication at the same time. So uh, we might have a lot of uh, anticoagulant or antiplatelet. So for my experience, we, don't, we do not use any kind of this medication for initial case. So for the flap monitorings, I... Mm, for, for the monitorings, I first of all I will I will check the general condition of the neck uh, that there is a bleeding bleeding into the wound uh, or not or, or maybe pass that compress the flap pedicles and even we 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 set the flap into the pharynx I mean into the deeper throat I might devise. Uh, the skin island outside as a monitors of the flap in every case. And uh, the reason is I want to pick, pick the, I mean, the skin picking uh, to, to observe the bleed. So, uh, so the thing that I want to, to see is the, is the colors and the onset of the bleeding. Uh, the healthy flap should be immediate bleeding after picking and the blood that leak should be bright red. So this is an example of the complication I, that I have. Uh, for the first pictures, uh, the, flap, the, the flap color and the contour is good, but anyway, for the pick, when, when we pick it, there is no bleeding. So even we cut, I mean, the, 
we trim at the at the edge of the of the skin skin pedicle skin island that is very minor bleeding and the second case is the is the same is the same complication but anyway it's different is because of the venous obstruction uh, you will see that except the the dark bleeding the skin contour the 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 color of the skin island is still normal. So for the first, uh, for the for the first two pictures, is the it's is an example of the vascular compromise. So if it be like this, I will send the patient to do an emergency flap uh, resuscitations in the operative room. So this is an example of the of the case that you will see, uh, you will see that the skin island is quite dark and that is a sign of the venous obstruction. And if we do the uh, success, resuscitation of the vein, the bleeding from the subcutaneous tissue is more uh, bright red. Okay, and the other example is also I also check the also check the surrounding tissue uh, because uh, for the extensive surgery that uh, that can cause the that can cause the vascular malfunctions of the surrounding tissues and the flap uh, I mean the donor side is also monitors uh, because of the distal limb can this top limb flat highways can, can have the risk of the compartment syndrome or limb ischemia. So this is an example of the case that we have. Uh, this is a recurrence papillary thyroid carcinomas uh, with massive skin invasion it, at both sides of the neck, but anyway, it's more, it's more from the right. First of all, I will check with the, with the CT scan that is operable or not, but anyway, it's, it's operable. Uh, the next step after I see the CT scan, I will check the, 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 the vascular, the vascular remaining that, 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 that I have. So uh, this is an, this is the thing that happened. So the and that happen. Excuse me. Uh, it's a, a bit beyond the schedule. So maybe okay. you show the highlights. And okay. Then this is the last, to maybe this is the, yes. the last light couple. Okay. Cap. Thank okay. you. Okay. So uh, you will see. Uh, this is the pictures of uh of the defect. I do the resection. Uh, at the lower 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 face. I mean the whole and the whole neck to until the uh, clavicular on the right. Uh, there is no vascular. I mean that there is no no vein, no vein on the right. So the thing that I do is I I search. I will try to place the pedicle and do the anastomosis side on the left. Okay, couple. This is an end result of the ALT free flap couple. So I think we are run off. We, we are run out of time, so I think I will skip the second case. Thank you, Kapom. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much, Adanat. I'm sorry for this uh, disturbing you, but I know that there's very interesting cases, and we can spend the time during the interactive session for discussion, and it's very nice to hear the tips and techniques that you have used. Okay, let's uh, move on to the uh, third speakers. We have uh, heard of the the regional flaps and also the free flap. Now then we're going to uh, move on to the third speakers who are going to talk about the non-surgical reconstruction and rehabilitation. Let me introduce uh, Dr. Fats Zlina Binti Abkarim. Uh, she's a clinic clinical specialist in prosthodontic and maxillofacial prosthetic in oral and maxillofacial surgery unit. Department of Surgery Hospital Cancellar Kangu Muris uh, from uh, Malaysia. So she's going to talk about the non surgical uh, rehabilitation and reconstruction for the facial defects. So please, uh, Professor 
Faslina. Thank you, Dr. Patrabut. Sorry, let me share my screen first. Okay. Uh, hello, good every, uh, evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Razif, uh, the person who introduced me to the organizer of Asian Head and Neck Network. Thank you, Dr. Patrabut, who contacted me uh, and invited me for this uh, seminar, uh, webinar. And thank you to the organ organizer, all of our organizer. Uh, as mentioned by Dr. Patrabut, I am Fazlina Abdul Karim. I'm not a surgeon. My basic degree is uh, in dentistry, but uh, I'm working closely with head and neck surgeon in my center, University Kebangsa Malaysia Medical Center. So um, I would like to share my experience in view of head and neck reconstruction, uh, even not on the surgical aspect, but it helped most of my patients to be back to the society with their prosthesis and uh, that cover their deformity. Okay, let's start. What is actually maxillofacial replacement or prosthesis is actually an, uh, the art and science which deal with the replacement of missing part or, or organ using artificial material. And this, uh, this replacement uh, can be general, not, uh, not only on the orofacial area, but also uh, other part of the body. So uh, as a maxillofacial prosthodontist, uh, I can help many of other colleagues uh, that need the prosthetic uh, help like oncology devices, rehabilitation and training devices. I'm also do finger, hand and other replacement. So uh, what is the causes of maxillofacial defect? It can be congenital or acquired. So uh, acquired normally due to uh, cancer uh, or tumor and also due to the surgery and trauma. Most of my cases is due to uh, cancer. So the type of maxillofacial we can divide into extra oral, mostly for cosmetic purpose. Uh, the, uh, it's help to restore normal appearance. Uh, example, the cheek replacement, lip, nose, eyeball and eyelid. Other than that is intraoral uh, prosthesis. It's mostly for functional uh, purpose to restore mastication, speech, normal respiration, uh, uh, for, especially for nasal defect. And also is replace uh, any missing part intraoral such as soft palate, tongue, mandible, and uh, other, other organ. Other than that, we also do miscellaneous devices. Uh, it mostly aid in treating cancer uh, and to protect tissue or to re-establish impact function of some body part. I will show to you um, some of the cases uh, with dip uh, in different types of maxillofacial prosthesis. So what uh, the material that been used for maxillofacial prosthesis is a plastic material such as acrylic resin, soft material such as silicon, elastoma, either room temperature or high temperature vaccination, or we can call it silicon rubber. Other than that, the hard materials such as metal alloy, glass, and also porcelain. So I will show to you, uh, I will share to you some of my uh, cases in UKMMC. Uh, for intraoral prosthesis, I divide it into intraoral and extraoral. So intraoral prosthesis, I will cover on obturator. There is an example of palatal augmentation prosthesis, soft palate prosthesis, and also mandibular resection prosthesis. For obturator, actually, we can call it according to the construction concept. First, we will construct the surgical stand, mainly made from acrylic, and it holds the pack uh, intraorally to stop bleeding and also has a local antiseptic or antibiotic to protect the operated area. And it's normally placed immediately post-operative procedure, such as mesilectomy. Then we construct the temporary or provisional or interim obturator. This to be used uh, for limited period and uh, until the complete recovery. And after that, we will construct the permanent or final obturator, uh, usually made from alloy and acrylic. And I will show you the example. This is example uh, when uh, we need to enter the OT together with the head and neck surgeon. Uh, so we will insert the surgical plate or stand immediately uh, after resection of the maxilla. And the, the stand help uh, or the, the plate help to hold the pack uh, normally contain of antiseptic or antibiotic. 
And then uh, after, do, uh, before insertion of surgical stand, we will take a, uh, the new impression in the OT, then we will construct a provisional or interim obturator on the right top there. Uh, this one patient will be used during the radiotherapy regime and for until the healing take part. This is an example of the final healing and uh, already stable. Then we will construct the final obturator for patient to be used and restore back the, uh, the mastication function and also speech. So what factor need to be considered before final rehabilitation? Uh, We must make sure that it's free from tumor. And then the, we must do the dental clearance before uh, start the radiotherapy. This is to reduce risk of osteoarthritis necrosis. Also, we need to do the dental clearance before chemotherapy. If the patient need the chemotherapy, reduce risk of osteonecrosis due to biphosphonate-based chemo agent. Other than that, patient will be uh, demonstrate or uh, demonstrate to do the jaw exercise to prevent from trismus or limitation mouth opening. We must make sure that oral hygiene maintenance need to be done with topical fluoride application. This one to protect all other remaining uh, uh, teeth uh, from radiation caries. Other than that, we can provide saliva substitute to the patient because most of the complication uh, post radiotherapy is the uh, lack of saliva. Other than that, uh, we need to uh, to. Uh, advise patient to reduce sugary food or drinks uh, just to reduce the rate of radiation caries. The most important is early preventive referral. So uh, after, uh, not after, uh, other than obturator, then we also construct a palatal augmentation prosthesis. This prosthesis actually we provide for patient post uh, glossectomy uh, that to help, help to restore deglutition function and also speech. As we know, this is an uh, example of impact mobility of the tongue for hemiglossectomized patient. So they have a difficulty to, to, to touch, uh, to the, for the tongue to touch the palate, which is helped during the deglutition and also uh, have an altered in the pronunciation. So this is an example of palatal augmentation prosthesis that we provide for the patient, which is still in the, this is partially dented. Uh, this is fully dented and this is uh, no teeth at all, or we call it edentulous cases. So we augment the area, the palatal area, so that the tongue can touch the augmented area. So help uh, the bolus of food to be uh, pushed back to the throat, uh, help in deglutition and also help in certain, certain consonant and vowel uh, in pronunciation. Other than that, we also do soft palate prosthesis. Sorry, I don't have a picture of my own patient. Uh, this is adapted from uh, Professor John Bumer, my Sifu. Uh, this is example of interim or provisional soft palate prosthesis. Uh, this patient still on radiotherapy cycle. And we provide a final definitive soft palate prosthesis. This help to restore soft palate defect and also prevent hypernasal, uh, hypernasal speech and also nasal regurgitation. This is an example of my case for soft palate prosthesis. Uh, you can see there is extended of uh, acrylic uh, material on the soft palate area that help patient to, uh, uh, to prevent from nasal regurgitation and also to restore the pronunciation or uh, hypernasal speech. Other than that, we also do mandibular resection prosthesis. This prosthesis is delivered after a mandibular resection to provide the remaining deviated mandibular segment and also improve occlusion contact with maxillary dentition. So patient able, still able to chew with the remaining, remaining mandible before we construct the proper prosthesis for, for them. This is example of my case. Uh, there is a restoration of mandibular prosthesis after surgical reconstruction with fibula bone graft due to osteosarcoma mandible. We can see here is the flap and actually there is no room for the prosthesis but we able to use the remaining uh, two structure that uh, present to hold the prosthesis. Okay, we move on extra oral prosthesis. I will show you some example of ocular prosthesis, orbital prosthesis. 
nasal, auricular, and also facial or mid-facial prosthesis. This is an example of ocular prosthesis. In my center, we do our or customize our own post, uh, ocular prosthesis by taking impression on the socket of the eye, and we do iris color painting uh, following the non-defect area, and we construct in the laboratory. We do the try-in first uh, of the wax pattern of the ocular to position position the iris and also to see the fitting before we construct in the laboratory. This is some example of ocular prosthesis. Can you spot which one is the artificial eye? Okay, actually all on the right side, except for these two photo on the top right here is on the left side. Other example of ocular prosthesis, maybe it cannot, uh, we cannot get 100% uh, like uh, the exact ocular, but at least it will help patient to, to have something and not uh, look abnormal. Other example of ocular prosthesis, we also do in the, lab, in the OT for children, especially because they cannot cooperate in the clinic. Okay. This is the very uh, nice case that I did it twice because uh, there is a changes of the iris color due to the patient still on the uh, chemotherapy due to retinoblastoma. So this is during... Uh, during uh, he is in, I think, seven years old, and this is 10 years old. So we can see the outcome is more, more, uh, uh, is better when patient grow. Okay, I can show you uh, a little bit of a uh, video that uh, show limitation movement of ocular prosthesis, even though there is no sight of vision, but uh, it help at least to uh, look better. Uh, better and look uh, present of the of the eye with the with the lim, uh, movement left right right very good up down left right okay this is also the example, which have a, even though it's limited, but but it's still a move. We move on the orbital prosthesis. Just now is the ocular of prosthesis. This is example. Uh, this one is fresh from oven before I insert or apply the eyelashes or eyebrow. This is example of my cases with uh, orbital prosthesis patient with uh, uh, Bowen, Bowen syndrome, which have a, uh, pos uh, uh, susceptible to many type of skin cancer. So there is a orbital exenteration here and we do the try-in. Uh, positioning and also most of my patient we will cover with glasses so that can help to camouflage a little bit of the prosthesis. Other example of the orbital prosthesis. This is also and this on the right side is the case, uh, my case with Prof Razif actually. Uh, so this young lady at least uh, come uh, back to Indonesia with some uh, prosthesis that can help to restore back the deformity. Other example, this one uh, on the right side, before we construct the orbital, there is just only the ocular, which is uh, look uh, more uh, deformed compared to the when we construct the, orbi uh, the orbital prosthesis. Other example of the advanced case of the orbital or, me, or we can say mid-facial, this is also example of the orbital prosthesis. Just sharing with you some of my cases. So we move on nasal prosthesis. 
This is example of nasal prosthesis for post partial rhinectomy patient due to basal cell carcinoma. And uh, there is a difficulty to get a similar skin color due to patient use a very uh, strong, uh, what we call, uh, adi not adhesive, strong uh, plaster to cover, to cover up the, the defect. And most of my cases, uh, they use a special medical grade A adhesive to attach the prosthesis. This is another example, post partial rhinectomy. This is before external coloration. Other example for post total rhinectomy, so patient can go back and uh, not have to cover the nose with, with a plaster or something else. Another example, for post total, almost uh, total rhinectomy patient. This is uh, done by my postgraduate attachment uh, student. This is uh, two pieces prosthesis. There is a uh, include nasal prosthesis and also upper denture. Uh, the example, we also do the nasal pro prosthesis with implant supported or attachment. Before this, I show to you all using the medical grade A adhesive. This is example of uh, nasal prosthesis that we, uh, which have clip at the back of the prosthesis so it can clip on to the bar of the implant. This is actually combination nasal and orbital prosthesis due to acid attack patient at least a patient have something before undergo a more surgical procedure to restore back the, the deformity due to the acid attack. Other than that, also, I also do the upper obturator and implant supported nasal prosthesis. This is the outcome. And patient can pronounce back uh, uh, fluently and understandable. Other example, also with uh, case, my case with Prof Razif, this one is an implant supported obturator and nasal prosthesis. So patient use the obturator with the implant supported intraorally and the nasal prosthesis attached with skin adhesive. This is also advanced case, a combination actually the upper obturator with magnet attached on the base of the acrylic and there is another magnet attached at the back of the nose, so it will clip together and hold uh, the, two, the, the two prosthesis will hold together. Another advanced case, uh, upper obturator and mid facial prosthesis with magnet attachment. Also, there is a three magnet here that attach at the, with three magnet at the back of the prosthesis. And I add <laughs> Uh, moustache, I do a swing of the moustache for this prosthesis to camouflage the vermilion border and also the filtrum area. Beside that, we also do a temporary facial prosthesis for patients who still undergoing radiotherapy treatment after the flap fail. So this is the example of the temporary facial prosthesis. Another example. This is also after the flap fail due to patient have uh, many medical uh, comorbidity. Then we, we provide with the temporary facial prosthesis. So patient can go back, go back home and come back for radiotherapy treatment. We move on auricular prosthesis. This is the example of silicon auricular prosthesis for post auriculectomy of neurofibromatosis patient. But this patient still, uh, we need to repeat many times due to the lesion is still not stable and need multiple resection. And this is other example of silicon auricular prosthesis. This is for adult patient and this is for children. Example of the children with the silicon auricular prosthesis. Other example, we still use the remaining uh, um, uh, what we call microtia, we, uh, the remaining skin tag on the ear, and we try to, to blend it with the prosthesis. Other example, this is quite difficult due to dog biting. 
uh, there is left partial of the remaining tissue and we try to blend it with the prosthesis. And all of this case uh, attached with the silicon uh, grade A, med uh, medical grade A adhesive. Other than that, we also do implant supported silicon auricular prosthesis. Uh, there is a clip at the back of the prosthesis and to be clipped at the bar of the implant here. Uh, easier for patient to use and to remove. Beside that, we also do a Michelinus devices such as device to treat trismus, tongue positioning stand, radiation carrier, and also radiation shield in my center. This is a represent maximum mouth opening for this patient. Patient was treated with chemoradiotherapy for nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So how are we going to help this patient? This is a uh, devices uh, that we provide in our center to help to treat trismus. There is a trismus screw. We ask patient to screw in the trismus screw to improve the mouth opening or we ask patient to use a wooden spatula and teach them how to insert the wooden spatula without compromising the other remaining tissue. And other than that, we also ask patient to buy the terabyte, which is in the, uh, in the market to help for treated uh, limitation of mouth opening or trismus. This is example of radiation positioning stand. Uh, sorry, I still need to adapt from my SIFU uh, lecture series because I don't have my own uh, patient photo. This stand help to position the tongue and keep mouth wide open. So this can allow the radiation to better focus on the tumor and help reducing dose delivered to the normal tissue surrounding. Other than that is the radiation carrier radiation carrier uh, attached with the polyethylene tubing, which will be loaded with radioactive iridium in brachytherapy. But then in our center, the brachytherapy no, no more use uh, for the oncology treatment option. Other than that, also we do radiation shield. This shield actually help uh, to for a patient undergoing radiotherapy treating tumor of the buccal mucosa, lip and skin, this shield actually separate the mandible and maxilla. It will simplify the dosimetry of, by flattening out the cheek and confine the radiation at the targeting tissue and reduce radiation dose to normal tissue. So it helps to protect the teeth from, uh, to, before, uh, before getting or from getting the radiation carries. This is other example that we construct the palate plate for cleft lip, uh, cleft palate patient babies. And other than that, we also uh, make an innovation uh, to construct a lip protector to prevent involuntary lip biting for this uh, young uh, boy with tumor in the brain. Uh, prosthetic also have a limitation, so need surgical alteration to enhance the prosthetic prognosis. So the combination from the surgeon and also the maxillofacial prosthodontist is important to discuss the outcome of the uh, outcome, outcome of the surgery. This is example the un of unfavorable sorry unfavorable orbital defect. This orbital defect with uh, was filled with flap. Thus, uh, there is uh, not enough space for the prosthetic prosthesis and difficult to restore facial asymmetry. Another example of unfavorable orbital defect, the lid were retained following orbital exenteration, so there is insufficient space for orbital or ocular prosthesis. So need a surgical alteration to restore it back. Other example of unfavorable defect, there is an abdominal flap covering entire left orbital defect. So there is insufficient space for the prosthesis to be hold on and this causes the facial asymmetry. So I cannot help such this patient. Other than that, this is example of also unfavorable facial defect. There is still the T wound, inflammation surrounding tissue, and there is obvious sign of infection. And we query about the recurrence of the lesion or tumor. So this is not ready for rehabilitation of facial prosthesis. This is example of favorable orbital defect. So this orbital exenteration defect is close to ideal. The entire content of the orbit have been removed and the orbital wall lined with skin. Other example, 
of uh, favorable orbital defect. We can see here lateral facial orbitals resurface with free flap, leaving the ideal space for the orbital prosthesis. So as a summary, artificial or prosthetic replacement is indicated as plain after surgery, as non-surgical final rehabilitation to replace missing part or organ. When practitioner need the civilian of his patient for long time, such as in cancer cases, inoperable conditions uh, such as extensive defect, contraindication, and a patient have a bad oral hygiene and also high cost for the plastic surgery. So I thank you. This is some of happy pay, happy some of the happy faces that treated in my center. This one. Uh, is the auricular prosthesis and this one, uh, the video just now I show, the ocular prosthesis. So with that, I thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zablina. Uh, you have done such a wonderful job and also the, it's a fascinating uh, lectures with the uh, examples that we will learn a lot. Okay, so now uh, we have already done for the three lectures. Uh, let's move on for the panel discussion. Uh, today we have uh, two panelists who will join in sharing their thoughts and experience and reflection on this, this uh, talk. Uh, I will introduce the two uh, panelists today. First one, uh, Dr. Siti uh, Razia. She's a consultant in the department of otolaryngology head and neck surgery in Singapore General Hospital and trained in both head and neck oncology resection and construction. And uh, the second one, we have uh, Dr. Ria, Ria uh, Trimatani. Uh, she's a ENT head neck surgery, facial plastic and reconstructive consultant, senior faculty in department of thoracology, head and neck surgery, faculty of medicine and also Director of uh, Human Resources, Education and Res Research for Dr. Kipto Mangankusuma Hospital. She's also the past president of uh, Pan-Asia Association uh, Academy for Facial Plastic and Reconstruction Surgery, past president of ASEAN Academy of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, and past president of Asia Pacific AOCMF region. So please, uh, Dr. Siti and uh, Dr. Ria. Hi, everyone. First and foremost, thank you, Prof. Patanasap uh, and Professor Christopher Go and Professor Adam and all of the organizers for inviting me to be part of the webinar. And also, um, thank you very much, Dr. Armando, Dr. Newt, and Dr. Aslina. Um, I really learned a lot from your talks. Uh, there were a lot of wonderful pictures, um, and your case examples were very impressive. So um, I don't have the wealth of experience of the majority of the panelists and speakers here, but what I can offer is my perspective as someone who just started or who has just begun the reconstructive um, journey and also the experience that we have in Singapore. So um, in Singapore, our reconstruction mindset actually has changed quite differently or significantly in the past two decades. So similar to Dr. Noot uh, in Sikuchen, we actually now prefer to act, uh, do the free flat compared to the medical flat because more of us are microsurgically trained and we are quite comfortable in the free flat technique. So our go-to free flat is actually the antrolateral tie flat. And the reason why we like this is because of the versatility of the flat. Um, we can raise it based on multiple perforators, and so we can design it in a chimeric technique. So it has multiple components, not only the passocutaneous components, but also has the muscular component, which is based on different perforators. So, so we usually use the muscle component of the chimeric ALT to plug the communication of the flow of mouth with the neck. Um, at the same time, you also use the muscle component to cover the carotid artery as well as the internal jugular vein. So it becomes an additional protective layer. So this has been very useful for us in our institution uh, where we have managed to minimize severe neck infection and the risk of subsequent carotid blowouts, even when um, small little intraoral or pharyngeal leaks happen. So I think that was an added advantage of using the muscular component uh, in the chimeric flap. So um, even in a radiated neck, we don't run away from the free flap anymore. Uh, what we usually do is that we usually explore the vessels first during the, during the um, resection surgery. 
we try to find the recipient vessels in the neck first, and we do expose these vessels all the way to the hilt where the superior thyroid artery or the facial artery originates from the carotid. Usually at this site, we notice that the radiation effect is very much um, is very is, is much less. So the integrity of the vessels is still um, is still decent, and the pressure flow heat is actually very good. So even with, if we anesthetize at this area, we usually don't encounter a problem, even in severe radiated neck. Um, for veins, we tend in severely radiated neck, we tend not to find any end vessel. So we do circumferential skeletonization of the internal jugular vein, and we anesthetize end to side to the internal jugular vein. That's what we usually do in our, uh, in our country. Very, very seldom do we resort to the superficial temporal vessels or the internal memory vessels, but that's very seldom. Um, but besides the LP, we also use the radial forearm, and the radial forearm, we usually use it for buccal mucosa or the retromolar tribune, or very small defects of the tongue that does not involve the flow of mouth. Because I think in these areas, the radial forearm thinness best match those areas. For our mandibular defects, we tend to reconstruct them with bone. So we do do the fibular bone. Um, and, but we do encounter problems with uh, plate uh, extrusion and uh, plate-related infections, post radiation. So nowadays, we have um, gone from doing a mandibular plate with the bony defects, with the bony flap, to essentially mini plates. And we found that essentially the um, stability using the mini plates is similar or comparable to using the mandibular plates. So we've, um, we're quite, we are gravitating towards that so that we can try to minimize the amount of plate that we put in that can be exposed um, during radiation. So medical flaps in Singapore, we usually use for salvage situation. This is when we don't find any recipient vessels during um, our neck exploration or the free flap we have used before have completely failed. Uh, those are the times that we use the free flaps, uh, the pedicle flaps. So our work cost, similar to what Dr. Amando has said, is actually the um, uh, pectoralist major flap. Uh, but we also do the trapezius flap. The trapezius flap we usually use for occipital defect because I think the reach is much better that way. So the only time that we considered using the pedicle flap in the primary setting is when the patient is extremely unfit and very, very unable to tolerate long surgery from free flaps. So the pet major flap has saved us uh, in the salvage situation because I think the muscle is very expensive and robust. So it provides a very useful envelope to protect the major vessels even when leak happens. So honestly, in my humble opinion, uh, I feel that the most difficult part of the hair neck reconstruction, I don't know whether Dr. Luke and Dr. Mandu would agree, is actually the inset. So I feel that it is extremely worthwhile to spend a long time actually planning the flap and designing the flap and designing the inset. Because uh, my, my opinion, my humble opinion is that the key is tension free closure and good pedicle alignment. So I'm quite particular when we inset the flap on how the flap is laid and how the pedicle look and how the pedicle is laid. So there is no twisting or kinkage of the pedicle. At the same time, when the flap is laid, there's sufficient muscle for bulk or sufficient flap for bulk. At the same time, there is also sufficient space for tension free closure. So no tension suture should be placed. Um, no tension suture should be placed. So because this uh, will minimize the risk of uh, wound edge ischemia and uh, subsequent heasons, which will then minimize the risk of slavery leaks between the suture lines. But that being said, of all the things and all the flaps that we've done, there are still certain places that we feel the free flap or the pedicle flap or local flap are um, still uh, not optimal or not best. And these are essentially in the case of nasal reconstruction. Um, uh, it's very difficult to actually do a proper nasal reconstruction. I think it's because the anatomy of the nose is very three-dimensional. And even when we do a composite flap, it's very difficult. So I think the prosthesis actually supersedes um, uh, an nasal reconstruction in that sense. Uh, and that's why I think Dr. Fazlina's pictures of the nasal prosthesis were quite beautiful. So um, that's honestly my honest opinion. Uh, I'm not sure what about your experience, Dr. Ria? Is it the same? Please, Dr. Ria. Well, thank, thank you, Siti. I, I think uh, Dr. Siti has uh, wrapped it up all of those three techniques, whether the uh, pedicle or the uh, uh, regional flaps or the free flaps or even the prothesis, because what uh, Professor Amando mentioned that the goal of reconstruction in the head and neck is actually functioning well. 
integrity and of course aesthetic. So uh, I think uh, uh, beside pyoplasty and microtia, one of my passion is doing uh, skin defect or uh, skin cancer reconstruction. And I think one challenge of the NASA reconstruction before head flap surgery, it is actually related to rhinoplasty. And it seems that it makes uh, us a better surgeon by understanding when you know to reconstruct the internal NASA lining, the framework, and also the external using the forehead. And this contour of the head and the face is required certainly creativity with uh, finding simultaneously. So as we, we know that uh, previous with the uh, uh, forehead flaps, uh, pre flaps, I think just uh, in the 1970s, if I'm not mistaken to arise, and this pre flaps uh, become, uh, shows more versatile and robust comparing to the pedicle flaps. And I think uh, in Indonesia, uh, mainly in Jakarta, yes, we do uh, uh, a lot of pre flaps, but uh, in the rural area, we still use uh, pedicle flaps and uh, regional flaps, especially when uh, uh, pre flaps needs a longer uh, time of uh, surgery, more thorough preparation, and then also using the ICU. And this is uh, quite a difficult uh, thing to do in, in, in Indonesia. So um, the PMM flap become the flap of choice actually for the head and neck reconstruction in many centers and uh, extensively used, however, concern regarding of the reliability of this flap, then uh, the choice of course is three flaps. But uh, I agree with uh, Professor Amando. Now uh, we have the emerging flaps that the supraclavicula artery island flap. This is also used also the mental island flap. So um, of course with this uh, PM flap, there is also a new classification uh, type 1, type 2, and type 3, uh, this uh, can be used in, in a, a wide area of uh, the construction. So nevertheless, that uh, PFAP is more superior, but uh, as, that, uh, as mentioned by uh, Professor Nat, that there is also uh, a complication. And uh, uh, one study uh, has been done uh, uh, about the PFAP leg complication, and they tried to to see whether this complication arise uh, seven days after the surgery, uh, uh, 30 day, 10 days, and then 30 days after the surgery. Although the complication rise only 1%, but the most failure occurs on the second post-operative weeks. So uh, I think uh, on which method uh, of choice, whether this the three flaps or the uh, pedicle or the regional flaps, both of course, I agree with Professor Siti, how we put the flaps and the pedicles is one of the important things. So um, maybe three flaps, uh, uh, what it is advisable for, in order to maintain a high successful, but uh, we well thought that careful analysis in every patient is needed to offer the best solution in the, uh, in the light of individualized treatment. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Siti and Dr. Rhea for your uh... Uh, your thoughts, your experience, and also your uh, the response on this uh, title. I think uh, the reconstruction is not only transfer tissue from one place to the other, but we have to really concern about everything, the underlying disease, the condition of the patient, the type of defect. And I think right now, even the situation of the you know, circumstance like COVID-19, you know, is also... Uh, effect on how we decide on using the, the surgical procedures or the reconstruction. So maybe we can also talk about this uh, later during the interac interactive session. So right now I would like to uh, bring all the speakers and the panelists come on the screen so then we can have the Q&A and also, you know, to uh, have a discussion about the topic. But before we go for the Q&A, uh, I like to, to bring the results from the quiz to see that how our audience uh, responds to the question. And uh, from the first one, uh, maybe Professor Armando will respond on this. The lower trapezius flaps should be designed in what manner to maximize larger surface area in designing the flap. So it's quite, you know, one third, an oblique transverse and pedal like just 2% for circular. So how you, did you respond on this one? 
Well, uh, based on my lecture, you can see that uh, I will design the lower trapezius slab in order to maximize the, the best surface areas in, in an oblique manner. Because okay. if you will design it in a transverse manner, some of the flap might be a random flap, especially on big defects. Uh -huh. So it will always be in an oblique manner. I see. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. With the longest, but still uh, with the underlying muscles that can keep the blood supply. Yes. Okay, thank you. So that, let's uh, move on for the second one. What are the factors uh, to be considered before prosthetic oral rehabilitation? Uh, one, rehabilitation site is free from tumor. Two, risk of osteoradionecrosis. Three, oral hygiene. And four, mouth opening. And 80% uh, yeah. said all of the above. Yes, correct. Professor Dilna. Yeah. Yes, go. Uh, Dr. Patrawood, because uh, we need to consider many, many factors before we, we construct uh, or do the oral rehabilitation so that the, the longevity of the prosthesis can be used uh, in a long duration of time and also patient can benefit towards the function and also towards the aesthetic or cosmetic effect of the, uh, from the prosthesis. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's, that's clear that we have to take out to account and everything. So uh, three is just uh, to see how uh, the participants will make choice for the patients undergoing total palatectomy with the cancer of the heart palate. What is the choice of reconstruction? 12% for local flap, 9% for regional, 27% for free flap, and half of the participants choose the prosthesis. So maybe I bring this question to the uh, speakers uh, to share your thoughts that for the defect in the uh, palate, you know, the total palatectomy. So what is your preference? Anyone? Dr. Dr. Nat, could you do free flap for this one? So for, uh, for my opinion, I think, if the patient is aging, so we can, we can, we can use the prosthesis. But anyway, if the patient is young and uh, the patient is free from the disease, the free from the construction is one of the choice to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to let the patient more comfortable uh, from the prosthesis because it's more natural. And okay. the patient don't have to care, take care of the prosthesis couple. So for, okay. my, for my question is, get on aging. Couple. I see, see the patients. Okay, how are others, Dr. Armando, any regional flap of local flap that uh, can be used? Oh, well, for the, if that is the problem, I'll be more practical. I will agree that the palato prosthesis is the best. Uh, speech per se for a free flap and a prosthesis will not really much of a difference. Okay. And, uh, of course, when I'm in my younger years, as a resident, I tried uh, a, a small pectoralis major uh, abutting the palate and part of the tonsillar area. But of course, as you gain experience, Sometimes you have to to be logical in your decisions. Right. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Armando. Uh, Dr. Ria? I do agree. Uh, maybe a prosthesis because of the, uh, yeah. It's difficult. It's difficult to achieve a good result. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Dr. Siti, maybe you do free flap as well? <laughs> yes. The patient is young. <laughs> yes. I'll do a free flap actually. So, what kind of flaps you gonna use for this defect? Actually, to be honest, if it's just a, a free radio, basic, uh, I would just do a free radio for arm flap because it's essentially to separate the nasal cavity from the underlying um, oral cavity. 
So a simple creative forearm flap would actually just suffice for the patient. Mm -hmm. Any bone needed for a um, to be honest, if it's no, there's no pre-maxillar involvement, there is no maxilla, inframaxillar involvement, no. If it's just a central palate defect, just a heart palate defect, a simple radio forearm would actually suffice. What do you think, Dr. Newton? Uh -huh. Okay, thank Very you. Much. Not, you would like to add on with this? No, no, it's okay. okay. So I think that is it. All, 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 all the things that I thought. Okay, thank you. You both agree. Okay, let's uh, see some question here, Q&A. And if the audience have any question, you can post in the Q&A. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Chun Jing Wong. Ask uh, Dr. Armando, would like to know after harvesting the PM flap, how did you, do you cover the huge defect of the chest? Maybe the one with the nipple areolar complex. Oh, well, that's a very hard question. During my younger years, I will make use of a latissimus dorsi covering the anterior chest. At least there's a cover of the anterior chest in, this, in the open wound, is at the back. But uh, in my series of patients uh, at this point in time, uh, if the patient is amenable to a very large split thickness skin graft, that is the best I can do, just to be practical. Mm -hmm. But it's a lot of bolus dressing. If the patient is not amenable to a... Uh, of course, that uh, split thickness skin graft will be applied on the first stage of the procedure. So I will ask the patient first, if uh, the patient is amenable to a splitting the skin graft to cover the very huge defect. If not, uh, I will just have it granulate. Secondary healing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, then uh, there's also the question from Anonymous attendee. <laughs> Dr. Fazlina, uh, very insightful presentation, thank you in Malaysia, other than SUKM, may I know if there are practicing prostodentists in the public service, Ministry of Health? Okay, so she wants to see where else we can do this. Okay, beside uh, Hospital Chancellor Mukris or HUKM, Hospital University Kebangsa Malaysia, uh, we do have a, a program, postgraduate program in University uh, Technology Mara in Sungai Buloh. Uh, but then the uh, most uh, in Ministry of Health, most of the cases uh, they will send the uh, the patient to me, all over Malaysia. And sometimes I do have a patient from Indonesia as well. Uh, that been uh, introduced by uh, mostly a head and neck surgeon from Malaysia. So uh, in the Ministry of Health, uh, there is certain area, uh, basically in Hospital Kuala Lumpur, they did on the intraoral. But for extraoral, most of the cases, they will, will refer to me. Mm. Okay, thank you. So you still have a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question from Dr. Indra uh, Pramadita Payu, Pamu. Uh, how about using advanced dressing like biostatic material or silicone foam dressing or even honey in managing post reconstruction surgery wound management? So, may our speaker share the experience? Okay, anyone? would like to share with this. That's it, please. Mm, I've used the honey um, dressing as well as the um, silicone foam dressing, which is in the form of Mapilex AG dressing for surgical, post-surgical wound um, management as when the uh, patient has like a little bit of a flap um, behesens or a little bit of wound infection, wound age infection. I feel that the Dressings, um, the Maplex AG dressings are very useful because the especially when it's um, impregnated with silver, um, they're also very soft and um, it protects the surrounding skin or the, um, uh, the, the basically it doesn't macerate the surrounding skin. 
Um, honey dressings are also useful because it's antiseptic um, uh, and it does help with the sloughing of um, any exposed wounds, uh, especially if, um, in setting of an uh, area where you have the skin graft and the skin graft looks a little bit infected, you can actually apply the honey dressing on top. However, it does take a little bit of time. Um, to be honest, I think nowadays we also have in places where in or in cases where we notice that there's um, significant infection of the flap and we're trying to um, essentially um, not um, make the infection worsen. We have used a particular kind of vacuum assisted dressing called Bureau Flow, uh, where it is essentially an antiseptic solution is actually flushed into the wound and then it is flushed in for a few minutes and then after that the vacuum um, actually sucks it up after a few minutes so it's an uh, interval. So we find that that's actually very useful in uh, prevention of uh, excessive or massive uh, infection when we already notice infection is set in so we can try to save the flap that we have or uh, and prevent um, uh, the infection from reaching the pedicle or reaching the anastomosis. So we have used that in such cases. So did you use it? Question. You use it when this ha have already been infected, or just used before to prevent it? Have already been infected. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Anyone? Any? Anyone would like to share with this using like honey or any? No experience. <laughs> Or uh, different kind of syrup. <laughs> well, there is a study in Indonesia about uh, yes. honey dressing. And I think it has been published uh, in one of the journals. Uh, they mentioned that this honey uh, it will have a high osmol uh, osmolality and mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, what, uh, prevent from uh, microorganisms and so on. And I think it, it really works in in, in infected mood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't did it will bring ants to the wound? No ants in it. No ants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Dr. Al Hafiz. How about reconstruction for children? Any special consideration in the choice of flap? Oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, pediatric patients that needs reconstruction, any consider, special consider differently from the, the adults? And then that. Uh, so uh, for my little experience, because I uh, mainly take care of the adult patient, yeah. uh, but anyway, for, for, my, for my knowledge, I think, uh, for the skin and the soft tissue reconstruction, I think it's the same as the adult. But anyway, it's, it might uh, make more challenge for the bone reconstruction, mm. such as mandibular reconstruction in, in, in child, because uh, we resect the growth plate and we replace with the, with the with bone. So there might be the uh, facial asymmetry uh, right after the reconstruction, so uh, for my experience, for my opinion, I think if I need to resect and reconstruction of the bone, I will with uh, resection and uh, reconstruct just only soft tissue only and let the patient grow. Out. And after that, I will reconstruction to gain function and cosmetic when the patient growing to adult. After that, couple. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And maybe we have to refer the patients talk to Dr. Faslina until they wait yes. for the construction. <laughs> you have any thoughts for the children with the defect? Dr. Faslina, you unmute the mic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I, uh, surgically, I have no experience, but then most of the children that been sent to me for the art artificial ears, uh, eyes is uh, for them to to change when uh, following the growing. So I I don't know with the choice of skin flap anything, <laughs> but then uh, most no, just of the role of the prosthesis for the children. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other thoughts, Doctor? Uh, doctor. Uh, yep. 
Well, I have uh, some experience on uh, two cases of teenagers, and I presented it in one of my lectures a week ago. And it's uh, a third degree burn contracture on the interior chest and the neck. So the problem of the, those patients, the patient cannot turn the head up and down. Patient cannot turn the head left and right. So it's a cosmetic and a functional problem. So one is a beautiful girl. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Nutt uh, will, uh, might have second thoughts doing a free flap because of the burn contracture of the anterior chest and the neck. So I did a, uh, a bilateral trapezius on that uh, male teenager and a one-sided lower trapezius of the anterior neck for that female. So that uh, in the long run, you don't violate the chest, whether it's a male, a female, whether it's a boy or a girl. So that's my experience. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay, thank you, Dr. Amanda. Dr. Ria? Uh, I think it depends on the defect, whether it's a soft tissue defect or is it also the framework or the bony defect. Sometimes if you don't uh, do the reconstruction, it also will um, interfere with their growth. For instance, for that, uh, what has been mentioned by Professor Armando, the contractor, you can imagine uh, how it will grow with the other organs or the other uh, uh, what the bones surrounding the contractor. So I think uh, it depends. It depends on the defect and the age of the, uh, the child is whether it is in uh, before in five years old, younger than five years old, or in the age of uh, eight, ten. It's a really different, uh, really uh, different uh, situation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rea. Uh, let me see, is there any other question from here? Okay, some of the questions have been already answered. So you can click on the answer one. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Siti also helped Dr. Faslina already answer some of those questions. Um, may I ask uh, on behalf, not on behalf, but for the young you know, uh, surgeons that who just stepped into the field of the head and neck, maybe, or even the general ENT surgeons that have to take care of the head and cancer patients that um, if at, right now we all agree that flea flap is the, the best uh, choice in terms of the defect, but if they have to practice, you know, as a, in the beginning of the practice years, what kind of flaps do you recommend them to, you know, at least in, uh, capable of doing these flaps to help them be able to take care of the head and neck can cancer patients that would be sufficient for, you know, during the beginnings year before they move on to the free flap and they, they are able to do. Which one is like, we know that, okay, PMF is a, it's a workhorse, but anything else or, uh, yes, please, anyone. Uh, I think uh, we always start with a simple defect. Mm -hmm. uh, rotation, advancement flap, the small thing that then we have the skill. Uh, one to, to design the flap and then to handle the flap, uh, not, not to traumatize the flap, and then even uh, to take care post-operatively. And then later on, we can start with a bigger defect using the PMM flap and so on and so forth. But uh, of course, we always move uh, or start with the simple one and okay. then uh, local flaps and then forehead flaps and then bigger flaps and of course a free flap. But uh, in the in advance, then we have to know then when it's not to do the operation. Mm -hmm. This, I think, the difficult operating is definitely okay. And then I don't think it's going to be a matter, but when not to do the surgery, that is the, the important thing. And choices for what this is. That's right. Thank you very much, Dr. Rea. And it's very important because the first surgeons who are the one who, you know, make the destiny of the, uh, of the patients. That is very important. Thank you. Any other thoughts of this to recommend with the young surgeons? Yes. Uh, I think uh, 
before you became a young surgeon or a uh, newly, newly graduated and a surgeon, you'll be a resident for four years here in uh, the Philippines. And uh, of course, we cannot get rid away of the basic foundation of uh, the pedicle flaps. The most, you should know how to harvest a pectoralis major. You should know by heart how to harvest a delta pectoral flap when the pectoralis major fail. So, and uh, I have experience using the latissimus dorsi and the lower trapezius flap from the back. But I uh, divorced myself using the latissimus dorsi because you have to tunnel the latissimus dorsi flap uh, underneath the pectoralis major flap. And, uh, and the reach of the flap is not that, that uh, acceptable for me. And every time the pectoralis major flap contract the first week, there are some, sometimes it might uh, compromise the blood supply. So I think uh, you should know the pectoralis major flap, the delta pectoral flap, and maybe the last option is the a trapezius flap from the back, but it is unpopular because of the position. But as, as I emphasize, if you are having a temporal bone resection, you can do it simultaneously. And for the head region, you should know the basic uh, midline, paramedian, and the lateral body forehead flap. And uh, I have also experienced using the cervical delta pectoral flap. That is a modification of the cervical facial flap. You just have a rotation flap uh, elevating the part of the neck the shoulder and part of the pectoralis, and you just rotate it upward. In cases of uh, that are contraindicated to a big surgery, uh -huh. big flap like, like the pectoralis failure flap. That's all. Okay, thank you, Dr. Armando. Um, yes, uh, well, we have uh, one, maybe one last question from Dr. Donya Rat. Uh, asking about the contraindication for free flap. We know that, oh, everything is uh, good for the free flap, but is any any cases that contraindicated for doing the free flap? So, uh, uh, so, uh, so uh, for me, in case that the patient can tolerate the long operation, uh, we can we we can we can find a solution to solve the problem about the free flap, such as in case that we have the uh, we have the contracture of the skin. I mean the fibrosis of the skin of the neck. Uh, we can find another. We can find another vein, or we can do it into size, or in case that we find that we have the we cannot find the. The, the vessel on the on the ipsy lateral neck so we will we remove the uh, pedicle of the flap the, the the flap to the contralateral side so I think it's nearly uh, it's nearly uh, don't have the contraindication just uh, relative such as the active infection on the surgical side mm -hmm. and absent totally absent which is nearly Difficult to find. I mean, the total uh, nearly absent cells of the uh -huh. neck in the neck. Uh -huh. So, I, so, for my opinion, if we can do the, if the patient can do the big operation, I mean, the long operative time, I think it's we, we uh -huh. can do the free flap. Uh -huh. Okay. Maybe the only contraindication for you is when the surgeons get sick. Huh? No. Uh, <laughs> we have tea. Okay. Like the city. We have a happy outcome. Oh, that would be also okay. Please, let us see any contraindication for the free flap. Actually, the I agree totally with Doctor New. Is the absolute contraindication essentially is when the patient cannot tolerate long surgery. That is the only one. Um, others would be um those where you can't find vessels in the neck or where the wound bed is infected. I think all those actually we can usually find a way around it. 
like the infected wound bed, we probably can essentially do dressings and clean it a little bit and then keep dry and then subsequently put the free flap over because the vascularized tissue from the free flap will also help with wound healing. And then for recipient vessels which are lacking, we can also find alternative areas. Like for instance, we can go to the chest and connect to the internal memory or we can flip up the kephalic um, for veins or we can go up to the scripture temporal. So we do have alternatives even if we don't find recipients in the net. So the only for me, for us basically, is the absolute contraindication would essentially be an unfit patient. And of course, if we are sick and the whole team is sick <laughs> and COVID has stopped us yes then probably not <laughs> yes <laughs> okay so thank you very much for our this fruitful discussion and Q&A thank you all the participants for the question uh, we also have the evaluation form that I would like uh, the participants everyone to <laughs> help in give some feedback on uh, how do you feel about our webinar? What is your suggestion? What kind of topics you would like to like us to organize in the future? So please scan with the Q, this uh, QR code and uh, then please uh, help us joining with the survey for the satisfaction. So otherwise I would like to thank you all the uh, panelists the speaker, uh, Dr. Armando, Dr. Nat, Dr. Faslina, mm -hmm. Dr. Siti, Dr. Rea, you have done quite a wonderful job on sh sharing your experience, your thoughts that is very uh, valuable for practicing uh, in the head and neck surgery in terms of the reconstruction. Uh, and hope you will join us in the future uh, webinar. And uh, for all participants, and uh, who already familiar with our webinar. So don't uh, leave the webinar yet because we still have the final, or we call the finale uh, as a compliment for all of us here. Yes. And it is the performance from our Arsene uh, head and neck surgeons. And that's because we are facing uh, the challenging situation with the COVID and also for our patients who might have a hard time and, you know, uh, the pain in the heart, uh, it can be the strength for you in the future. And this will comes and goes as the seasons keep changing over time. And this is the song that we select uh, to be performed and uh, the song that you will hear is from uh, Boy Kosi Yepong, is the popular song of, uh, in Thailand. But right now, you're going to hear from uh, our colleagues in ASEAN country to join, sing, perform with this song. And after this song, you will meet with uh, Dr. Malindra Adam, the yeah. former president of ASHNO, to uh, give a close remark. So enjoy the song and thank you very much. Okay, let's hear the song, Season Change.
ที่ฟ้าไม่เป็นใจอย่าไปคิดว่ามันเป็นวันสุดท้ายน้ำตาที่ไหลยังมีวันจากหายหากไม่รู้จักเจ็บปวดก็คงไม่สึกถึงความสุขจะเป็นช่วงเวลาเริ่มต้นของเอเชียเฮดนักเวบินาร์กับเรื่องเทคนิคของเฮดนักสถาปนาที่เกี่ยวข้องกับการสอนที่เกี่ยวข้องกับการสอนที่ And Dr. Fazlina binti Abdul Karim, and also for the excellence uh, and educative and comprehensive lectures. So, and uh, also for the beautiful ladies uh, tonight as a panelist, uh, Dr. Siti Radzia and Dr. Riyati Martani for their uh, a clear comment and thought about the topics. So, of course, for the never-ending support from our moderator. Dr. Patrafut f a d a d a s a p and then the chairman, Professor Christopher Go, and then two uh, uh, organizing committee, Professor Alfredo Pontejos and Professor Razif. You can sing very well, Razif. And myself would like to thank for the everyone, especially our great audience. Uh, until we now, uh, until I think we uh, can reach the 350 participants, and also thank you for supporting team. So as uh, the title songs, the season change uh, when bad day comes, the pain in your heart is like being devastated by storm. Tell yourself that the pain will fade away, like we see in the changing season. So, this is my last uh, words. The pandemic can prevent us to meet face to face, but cannot prevent us to share the knowledge, and continuing education and bridging the science. So, see you in the next tense Asian Head and Neck webinar in August with a. Topics of a non-primary cancer, and of course, with the Malaysian song organized by Professor Rajiv. Good night and stay safe. Bye bye. Yes, let's yes. take a photo, <laughs> everyone. Yes. So everybody, all the audience particip participants, please turn on your camera. We're gonna take a big group photo. โอเคคุณชิคอนดักเลยครับ
Okay, I will count to three. So everyone, please smile. One, two, three. Okay, one more. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Have a good night. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajahn Superwan. Thank you, Ka. Good night. Good night, Ka. Good night. Good night. Miss you, Melinda. Bye. Miss you. Oh, Indra is also here. Hi, Visana. Bye-bye. Bye. Yes. Bye. Your Indra, your voice is so good. <laughs> Thank you, bro. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank bye, you. Stay everyone. safe, everyone. Thank you. Yes. Bye, Maria. Bye, Rizli. Bye-bye. Take care. You. Good night. Bye, bye Melinda. Alfredo. Razif. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you, Fazlina. Yeah, Thank you, Dr. Patravut. Yep. Stay safe, everyone. Yes. Yes, you too. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm.